Welcome to Moms in a Zone. We're so excited to have you on our guest on this episode. Today's guest is Coach Mike Loxley. He is the head football coach at the University of Maryland. Welcome, Coach Loxley. How are you? What's going on, Yvette? How you ladies doing? <laughs> we're doing well, doing well. But we're not gonna, we're not going to hold you long today. We want to get right to it because we have some good things that we want to share with our uh, guests today and our audience. The first question out the gate that we want to know, tell us a little bit about Coach Mike Loxley. Man, I hope you got enough time for this because I, I, <laughs> I could talk about myself for a, a, a long, long time. But no, um, I'm like everybody else in this business. Uh, you know, growing up, and, and it's funny because I grew up in a single parent household with just my mom. Uh, my dad mm. was not around very much. And so like most kids, you grow up wanting to be like your dad. Well, my dad's happened to be the Boys and Girls Club coaches that coached me because I was a police Boys and Girls Club uh, uh, child growing up and mm -hmm. spent countless hours over in the Boys and Girls Club playing every sport known to man. And so all the mentors and, 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 and male role models that coached me became kind of father figures for me and it led me into this profession. I knew if I wasn't uh, good enough to play at the highest level, that I wanted to somehow stay involved in, in the game. And so naturally, right when I got done playing, I got right into coaching. You know, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area uh, and spent my childhood in, in D.C., the southeast section of the city, a really tough neighborhood. Uh, you know, saw a lot of things growing up. And if it wasn't mm. for sports, as I like to say sports saved my life. Uh, I had two older brothers that spent most of their adult lives in prison. And because of sports, uh, that little brown football has given me and, and my family the opportunity to break the generational curse. Um, mm. I was able to earn a degree from Towson State University, a business marketing degree, uh, got right into coaching. I went from being a player uh, to the very next year, a full-time coach. So wow. um, I'm one of those guys that I, I started everything a little early. Um, I got married at 21. I've been married for 28 years to my lovely, uh, smart wife, Kia. Uh, we had four kids. You know, I got two grandsons that are all here in the D.C. area as well. So uh, spent the last 30 years uh, raising everybody else's child. Um, mm -hmm. I've coached at the Naval Academy. I've coached at West Point. I uh, spent time at the University of Florida, the University of Illinois. Uh, was the head coach at New Mexico where I failed miserably, had to revamp and uh, rebrand myself, uh, spent time at the University of Alabama, uh, and then had an opportunity to come home and, and take over my dream job, a job that growing up in the D.C. area, I was always a huge Maryland fan. I spent countless hours here in what was called Old Bird Stadium, rooting for my hometown team, the Terps, and really blessed and honored that uh, a couple of years ago was able to come back home and and take over a, a job that i had always coveted and uh, something that i take very seriously because one i look at it as having a platform uh, and a uh, basically an opportunity to do what other mills and coaches did for me which is mm -hmm. help me become the best version of myself and you know that's been my coaching philosophy is that i want to make better husbands, fathers, sons, uncles, uh, through the Brown football that changed my life. That's Coach Locks in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, I just want to add, his wife is so fabulous. Wow. <laughs> I mean, this, this was just amazing. And everything that you just stated, my, it leads to my very first question out the gate. And that question is, what do you say to a young African-American male who may have had the same similar upbringing. Dad wasn't in the home. The surroundings, you know, are not as positive. They have maybe witnessed older siblings or cousins come in and out of the correctional system. What do you say about those dreams and, and going after those dreams when everything seems so dim and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel? What would you say? Well, I always use the analogy that, you know, I am that dream. I, I was that mm. kid. I was you. I, I, I sat in the, the bedroom and I and I dreamed really big dreams of opportunities of being able to change the lineage of my family, one through the game of football. And I, and I know a lot of people kind of get kind of upset when they hear that you use uh, football as the way out. Well, the good thing about the way the college game is set up is that to play football, 
there's some things that you have to do academically that come along right. with it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I tell them is, you know what, the 12 to 13 Saturdays that you get to step between the white lines and play the game that you love, uh, those are all on you. You, I can't do anything for you when the game starts because it's up to you to execute and do your job playing the game. But it's those other 353 days that I'm going to be responsible for as the father figure, the leader. I've got to make sure you eat good. I got to make sure you got a roof over your head. I got to make sure that you learn and understand discipline uh, outside of just football. I got to make sure you're going to class. I got to make sure you got tutors and study hall. So I'm going to put a program in place to help you do all the other things, those other 353 days, just so you can focus on football. And to me, that's a heavy burden for a heavy, for a football coach, but that's what I enjoy doing. And so uh, anytime you have the ability to set a vision for a kid, for me, a, a vision of I was you. I sat mm -hmm. the same, same, I walked the same path you walked, and I'm here, and I didn't even play in the NFL. I'm running a multi-million dollar uh, business, basically, as a head football coach, and never played it down in the NFL and have been very successful, one, because of the degree I earned, but two, also because of what the great game of football has uh exposed me to so um living testament that i am that dream that you have to see that there actually are people that have gone through a lot of the things you've gone through from seeing death at an early age to uh, seeing loved ones go to prison to seeing uh, family members uh, addicted to drugs and have all those things around you in the concrete jungle but still have a way to become a rose coming out of the cracks of it and um, I love that part of my job, and that's why I'm very passionate about what I do. I had a question, Coach Foxley. Just, <laughs> just that story in itself, is that why you created the organization that you did for minority coaches? I mean, because you had that special, you know, touch or experience that you can relate to some of your players. Is that part of the reason that you started the organization? Well, it, it's a small part. I, I've always been a big believer. Um, we need more guys like myself in this profession. We need, mm -hmm. I need to continue to bring up more young uh, minority coaches. And, and minority doesn't just mean black men. It could be women as well. I mean, as you can see, there's been so many women uh, that have now got into the game of football because of the, the role they play as both mom and sometimes dad, the dual role. Um, but I started the organization because one, as I like to tell people, and I'll keep it PG-13, you know, my give a stuff gauge is, uh, is on E. Like I re I'm at a point where I turned 50 Christmas day and I'm yeah. 30 years in this profession and <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not really worried about pissing people off or being politically correct. I just want to do what's right. Um, and I really feel like when I came into this business, uh, there weren't very many people that look like me in the roles that I'm in right now as a head coach, let alone as a coordinator, which I did obviously at Alabama where I, I met, I met you, Andrea, but, uh, and the frustration of it uh, for me is that, you know, when I hear and read about that there are not enough candidates for these head coaching jobs. And I know so many different people that have the skill set to do it and all they need is the opportunity. And so I enlisted the help of uh, all my dear friends and mentors that helped me get to the point where I'm at. Guys like, you know, Coach Saban at Alabama who uh, helped me rebrand my career, made me the offensive coordinator there at Alabama and had great success. Uh, Mike Tomlin, a great friend of mine, who mm. was the head coach and won a Super Bowl. Rick Smith, uh, former GM of the Houston Texans and, you know, Bill Polian, a lot of really successful people that all played a small role or a big role in helping me get to the seat I'm in here at the University of Maryland. And so I look at it as a way of trying to pay it forward. Um, maybe bring up uh, another Mike Loxley down the road to help them get to the point I'm at. Because, you know, when you look at the numbers of minority uh, minority coaches that are head coaches, it's 14 of us out of, uh, uh, you know, 132 uh, Division One jobs uh, in the college Division One game. There's only four of us uh, in the NFL. And I just think there's so many more talented minority uh, candidates out there that really only thing they need are opportunities. And so the three pillars of the National Coaches, National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches for us are we want to prepare 
and that means give the tools necessary to help you get the job or be uh, be able to have the experience you need to do a successful job uh, to promote meaning do a great job of making sure that everybody knows who these great coaches are that have the ability to do the job and then you know the next thing for us is to make sure that we uh, we do everything we can to prepare them and, and, and you know for us it's really important that those three things we do every everything we can do prepare promote and produce the next wave of coaches coming through the the pipeline and we're going to use the power of our uh, board of directors guys like Doug Williams and Ozzie Newsom and just a, a wide array of people that really find it important to help the, the, the task of preparing, promoting, and producing the next wave of minority coaches and for whatever level it is they want to be at. And, and, and you, what you just stated is so important because I think one of the things uh, as far as us as moms, we see African-American males dominate the sport of football specifically. But as you stated, when it comes to the positions of the next level in coaching and, and GMs, we don't see us. We, we, we don't see reflections of, of us on those, in those positions. And one thing that you said early on is that you had a position where you felt like you failed miserably at, and, but you came back. And so then my question is on that, what do you say to a, a young kid who is going from high school, want to play collegiate or in collegiate, not necessarily even has a goal of going to the NFL, but wants to stay around this sport but maybe, you know, they, they feel like they failed because they didn't make it to the NFL. What would you say about that kid, about failure and then success after the fact? Speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I love to use this. And any player that's ever played for me will, will, will recall me at some point having these conversations. And I always use the term. And I learned this from Debbie Yao, who's one of my mentors. She was the athletic director here at Maryland. She serves on our board of directors. And I can remember when I failed miserably at New Mexico as a head coach, and I remember calling her, and I'm at a crossroads in my career as to whether I go back and be an assistant, a coordinator, do I just get out of it? What, what do I do? And, and she, I remember her saying, you know, Michael, failure is not final unless you, mm -hmm. allow, unless you allow it to be. And she said, what we need to do is take a 360, um, look at yourself, find out what it is you would do differently if you were given this opportunity, what you can do better as a coach. And so I spent time, uh, you know, when I got let go after the fourth game of my third season at the University of New Mexico, and I spent basically from the middle of September till December trying to map out a plan as to what I needed to do uh, to, 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 as I looked at myself in a 360, 360-degree uh, uh, view of myself, of what I could do better as a coach. And so um, I, what I would tell the student athletes that failure is not final unless you allow it to be. And I can tell you this, um, I learned more during those two years and four games at New Mexico failing than I did the three years I was at Alabama going to three straight national championships. Now, don't get me wrong, I love winning and I love that what I learned from being a part of a winning organization like Alabama, but the tools and the things that I learned from the adversity I faced as a head coach where I failed are the things I use more today here at Maryland in the role I'm in now than even a lot of the things I learned being a part of a winning organization. So you learn so much more from failure than you ever can in success because sometimes success hides deficiencies. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, what I would tell any kid that has faced adversity or that has maybe failed is that failure isn't final. I mean, that's not the end of the world. Uh, you can overcome it. You just have to learn from it. And where you make the biggest mistake is if you don't learn why you failed. And so that, that would be my advice. No, oh, that's, that's awesome advice. Awesome. <laughs> yes. And then here's, here's another thing I have for you is when you're looking for as a head coach and you're on the recruiting trail and you're out there looking for players, what we know that, you know, we say they have to pass the eye test and there are some measurables that they have to have. We've all been through that with our student athletes. What are the other things that you are looking for? And I say this because I've had moms come and talk to me, is that parents have to be honest about, and you fill, fill that in. Because a lot of times 
parents have these goals of their kids going to the next level and maybe the kid is just not there or maybe the dream is not even the uh, the 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 athlete so parents have to be honest about what in the recruiting process yeah i, I think it starts one with um you know you're going to always be recruited to where you should be now and and that's at that time because i've seen players that maybe have gone to lower level programs that turn out to be great NFL players because they develop later in their careers. Uh, they, they, their skill set continues to develop. So, you know, the biggest thing I talk about is, you know, not every kid is a division one player, but that doesn't mean that you can't make football uh, or use football to change your life because ultimately the, the goal is to get the degree. And if you can continue to play football after the fact, that's the icing on the cake. And I do think that there's these unrealistic uh, views sometimes that happen. And one of the biggest issues I see with parents and recruiting is they, they, they compare themselves to little Billy. They see what somebody else is maybe getting. And then they want to say, well, how does he get it? Or how, why is he being recruited? And I mean, what I try to tell everybody is, hey, let's, let's take care of our house. Let's figure out what we can do or need to do to get where we want to go. Now, there's so many parents that invest so much time, energy, money, and effort into helping their helping their kids become Division I uh, players. But to me, if they have opportunities to go to school, possibly for free, uh, you know, ride that till the wheels come off, um, you know, because not everybody is going to be able to play Division I football. And one of the things I do in recruiting is I try to be really as honest and as open as I can. Uh, if a mom or a parent sends me video, we evaluate every tape that comes through our door. And, and then we follow it up with, you know, as of right now, maybe, you know, this, this isn't, you aren't what we're looking for. Uh, mm-hmm. But doesn't mean that you're not a good player. And that, those are the tough conversations. But um, I think it starts with one, you're going to be recruited to the level that your skill allows you to play at typically. Um, there's too many great programs out there that, that have processes in place where very rarely do we miss or very rarely are we wrong. Now, there's some places where, you know, they see things and foreshadow things a little, you know, they see two, three years down the road, this is what we think he'll be, and they'll take a chance. And I think, you know, I got so much respect for programs. I mean, at the University of Maryland, our job is to go out and find the best players that fit what we're looking for. And for me, I can tell you, it starts with being smart, tough, and reliable. Those are the three Mm. things when you talk about uh, outside characteristics that we're looking for besides the eye test and what you put on tape. Mm-hmm. We're going to do the research to find out is he a smart and smart doesn't mean you have to be a 3.0 student. Smart means you make good decisions. Smart means, you know, uh, instead of going to hang out with guys that may be smoking weed or doing things they aren't supposed to, even though they're your boys, you know how to stay away from it. Tough. You can't play the game of football without being mentally and physically tough. Mm-hmm. It's not one of those sports that, you get immediate gratification. You know, if you play offensive line like Emil plays, you know, very few people say, let's go out and put heads and helmets on and run into each other 80 times in the hot sun for an hour and a half to two hours. I mean, you don't see the results or you don't get an immediate gratification from it. So, um, and then reliable, you know, as a coach, I got to know that you're going to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there because it usually transfers over to the football field. If it's third and one, and I expect you to step with your right foot and use your inside arm to, to seal this guy, well, if you are reliable in all the other aspects of your life, there's a good chance you'll be reliable on third and one when we need you to be more re- be reliable most. And so mm. for us, smart, tough, and reliable are three of the characteristics when we start evaluating players outside of just the football skill. Those are a must to come play for me. How is it doing the recruiting now with COVID? Because, I mean, typically, I know for me, I would make sure Emil goes to the campus, goes to the camps, and and I know you've got the huddle fields, but what else can you do to actually see, you know, what that player is about with COVID? Yeah, as you know, the recruiting process is a two-year, three-year window for us. So, like most of the guys that we're recruiting for the 21 class, we've evaluated for the last two years, so before COVID. I think who this will most affect will be the 23 class, uh, the 22 mm-hmm. class a little bit, but the 23s and the 24s who, who are guys that we would typically have been able to see in spring practice this past May, go out and saw their games here in the fall, 
uh, the, the 22s and the 23s will be the people I think this most affects. And so what we've tried to do here uh, is a lot of uh, Zoom meetings, FaceTime meetings, uh, get as much of the game film stuff that we can get. And, and, you know, there's so many other people now involved in the recruiting process from the, uh, the weight coaches, the strength trainers, the, the DB developers, the O-line developers, that we have to develop uh, allies, be, to become allies with that can feed us information on players. And, and usually they're people that we know and trust for an evaluation, but we try to get as much of anything they do on film to make a visual or film evaluation. But we're still hopeful that we can get through this pandemic, get out and go see some of these uh, young kids play in the spring if, if we're capable and able to do that and, and just utilize uh, all the resources we have to try to get them evaluated to see one, how they play, but then also answer the other questions, are they smart, tough, and reliable, which a lot of that is done through phone calls and your connections and knowing the right people to call and the right questions to ask. Do you actually look at like film that like a mom or somebody would send you? I mean, I didn't, I never thought that that would happen. I know your best really good about mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff. Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, I would tell any mom out there, you know, I'm not going to wait for anybody. You know, the film is going to speak for itself anyway. So if the film is great, I was just one of those moms, you know, I'm going to get there out to the masses because I don't know if you can get in the stands or come to the stands, but I'm going to make sure that you at least have the, the, the huddle in your email. Now, if you watch it or you don't, I can't have no control of that, but I'm going to make sure that you have it. And when you see it, it it's all there. So I'm, I've always been an advocate of sending if a parent wanted to send, if a mom wants to send it, I'm one of those, send it to the coaches. The worst they could do is put it in the trash or not look at it, but go ahead and answer the question because you know that's something that I'm, I'm passionate about. <laughs> I can tell you that recruiting has come really so far along from the days of, of mom and pop having to send tape, you know, the old mm -hmm. VHS tape with the bubble mailers. Right. So most Division One programs like ours, we have contracts with Huddle to where we get all the game film. Um, you know, highlight tapes are nice, and, and you know, but we don't evaluate kids off of highlight tapes. Highlight tapes are, are – I would watch the highlight tape first just to say, oh, okay, good play. But then I'm going to go put four games on, and we create our own tapes here, which we call the good, bad, and ugly, to where we pull off their good plays, we pull off their bad plays, and we pull off some of the ugly ones and say, all right, now why is this play ugly? Is it because he can't run? Is it because he ain't strong enough? Is it because of technique, which – you know, I don't evaluate a high school kid sometimes on how they do things because you don't know how they're being taught. You know, a lot of the kids I recruit come from some programs where maybe they don't have the best coaching or uh, a, a personalized coach to train them. And so, you know, I'm into taking that raw mold of material and then bringing them in on in, in my watch, on my watch and developing them, which is why, you know, I think being located where we are, not having kids able to get up to camps where we get get to make a camp evaluation. You know, I put so much trust into our camp evaluations because if a kid can play in camp and, and do the things we ask them to do in our camps, then if we screw that up, that's on us. You know, sometimes what you watch on tape, you can't tell because you don't know what they're being taught. So yeah, I, I, I watch everything. If a parent sends tape and it's a kid that we've evaluated or has come across our desk as a potential player, we take all the film that we have on them and we go through them and we make our own cut-ups from it for us to evaluate the film that we create. So yes, we do uh, take uh, mom's uh, got from the top of the station wagon yelling, go baby, go baby on it. We just turn the volume down sometimes so we don't have to hear some of that, hear some of the play-by-play. -play. Right, right. So you don't need, you don't need the sound effects. You just need, need what's going on on the field. Baby. Hey. Baby, get up. Don't hit my right. baby like that. <laughs> uh oh, I think I he's love great it. Coach I love it. Now, sister. <laughs> moms hear this. Yes. Coach, so, so, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, just, just what do you do with those, those athletes that once they're recruited, um, you know, they were the man at, 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 at the high school level? and they get to college and they're just not doing what they need to do, I guess, academically. 
they're not going to their classes. They're, they're, they might go to study tables, they might not. They're really not doing what they need to do academically because they're resting on the fact that they're just athletic and they're the man and they're gonna get playing time. What do you do with that athlete that has that mentality? Um, because it seems like at the end of the day, they're really hurting the team by not doing what they're supposed to do academically. Yeah, that goes back to the smart, tough, and reliable. You know, reliable for us, uh, we don't have a lot of gray areas in our program where you can choose to decide whether you want to go to study hall or not go, or you choose to go to class or not go, and, and nothing takes place. And, you know, most of the guys that have played for me, whether it be as a head coach or as a, a coordinator or an assistant, and when I sit on a couch and tell mom that I'm going to take care of your son like he's my own, I mean every word that I say, and that means, you know, if my son ain't doing what he's supposed to do, he's going to sit his butt down. And I would rather lose without him than win with him, knowing at the end of the day, you know, I always say this, you know, the big man upstairs, when it's my time, he's not going to care about how many games I won. He's going to want to know, did you do right by the people he sent under, your, under his tutelage, under my tutelage, mm -hmm. to make sure that they're good people. And so um, I had a conversation two days ago with a kid. We meet every Thursday with our academic counselors, our uh, mental health specialists, our compliance people, and we go through the whole team and we get weekly updates of where guys are and we're broken them up by position. And so we have academic counselors that give us as coaches the report. And I'm one of those guys that, you know, if I get two straight weeks of uh, bad reports, um, I've had a conversation with a guy that said, listen, by next Thursday, if I don't hear that I see improvement out of your effort, we're going to remove football because obviously football is taking too much of your time and that you're not able to put it into your academics. So I'm going to help you by suspending you from all football-related activities and everything you do is academically. So um, those conversations are tough. But when you take something away, as I've learned, having raised four kids, when you take something away from them that they love, whether it's a cell phone, allowance, cars, playing time, they usually get the point pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Get that exactly. motivation. <laughs> yeah. Just the dynamics of being a coach. And then you're also a girl's dad. I know for me, because I play sports, I mean, I was always yeah. like, you, you could do better. You could not, you know, not always recognizing the good thing so are you that kind of dad or i mean because you're a girl dad so you oh, be the same way i, I am a girl dad because i had three boys and a girl and what i've learned very quickly is the three boys are always mama's boys you know when they play their sport <laughs> they very rarely say hey dad or i love you dad they always say hi mom love you mom well <laughs> i had to have somebody that that worship dad that's going to take care of me when I'm, uh, in one of those old folks homes at least come visit me um no i like being dad and when they play sports i've always tried to remain dad and if you ever talk to coaches kids one of the toughest things is you know when you're that dad that also is the coach they already have enough pressure on them because most people yeah. think because your dad's the coach as if that gives you special privileges and and, and, you know, we've got a couple, like Coach Tomlin's son, Dino, is on our team here. I recruited Dino to play for us, and he hates if I even bring up anything about his dad. So I always tried to remain dad. Her motivation came is because she had three older brothers. And so right. she saw all those college coaches, and they all were Division One football players and had recruiting. And her only mission in life was she wanted to be recruited and as heavily as they were. And she was. Right. I mean, she had scholarship offers, the University of Southern California, Tennessee, all over the country, Texas, Texas A&M, and she chose to go to Auburn. Um, and the motivation for her came intrinsically just by having a tag along for all of her older brothers, soccer, football, basketball. And it's, you know, she was a natural athlete. Um, mm -hmm. Probably I always tell people she was the best athlete in the house because she was always kind of like the crash test dummy uh, for the boys. I mean, and they say, come stand right here and then dunk on her and knock her over. Or they played rough with her when they played. And, she, you know, she followed her brothers, especially my youngest son, Kai, all over the place until he realized that he started liking girls. And she's like, well, what? I can't go now. And so all of a sudden she couldn't go. <laughs> but no, she's made her mark. She's made her mark on her own as an athlete, was a great mm -hmm. basketball player and, you know, full scholarship and soccer to go to Auburn. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of her and, 
you know, because it's hard for girls. I mean, it's hard for girls in, in college athletics. They normally don't, don't get the opportunity, but she earned a full scholarship. She's doing really well. She's overcoming adversity with some injuries, but was voted captain this year going to her uh, junior year and really proud. So I'm bragging on her a little bit. No, yes. okay, you can brag on that black girl magic. Yes. <laughs> now, Coach Loxy, I do have a question as far as, and I don't want to get too deep in the woods, but I know that she had her brothers, but did you send her to training? I mean, how did you get her prepared to be at, you know, her top level of performing? Yeah, so the big thing for us was obviously with the, uh, being a coach, uh, we, we had some natural connection. So she was always around college athletics. So, you know, we put her in sports very early. Like all three of my sons, we put in Taekwondo before they played sports because I wanted mm -hmm. to teach them, you know, me not being around and having to coach and take care of all y'all kids. They needed somebody <laughs> to teach them, you know, the, the discipline that comes with doing Taekwondo as well as the, the toughness because it's a – you know, it was one-on-one -on, -one on that mat. And so mm -hmm. with her, we put her in the same thing. And then we started them all in soccer. And then they gradually started playing all the other sports. I'm a cross-sport guy. I don't like them having to specialize. Mm -hmm. I really think the kids growing up nowadays start specializing too early. Uh, right. I think it, it, it goes into maybe some of these injuries they have. But um, we've always just given her and all of our kids the opportunity and the exposure, of whether it's going to soccer camps on – the college campus I worked at. Um, when we moved here uh, we, from New Mexico to the Maryland, D.C. area, uh, we did research uh, on the top soccer clubs in this area. Um, she'd shown pretty early in her career because she was fast and could run um, that, that she had a skill set. And so we just tried to expose her and put her with some of the best uh, programs that had the best coaches. I was big on I want her to be taught and not just thrown out there and just go play. And so most of my research wasn't necessarily had to be the best programs for winning, but I was looking for the best coaches. And so I used to utilize the women's soccer coach here um, to, to find out what are the top female or girls soccer programs in the area. They gave us two or three. We did research, went to visit them. And then we, we started with a program here called Maryland United that had also had other black girls on the soccer program. And, and it was an amazing, amazing experience for her. And then, you know, she was able to turn it into earning a full scholarship and actually did some stuff with the Olympic uh, development program and got invited to uh, two Olympic camps for her age group. And we're hoping that, uh, you know, she just continues to grow with it. And coach, I have two, two questions based off of what you just stated. The first question is, you're, you're a unique guest because you're coming from the perspective of not only a head coach um, of a program, but also we're talking about your role as a father as well. So the first question is, as a head coach, what would you say to a mom? Maybe she's a single mom and she's on this recruiting process and this is her only child. She has no other children. She doesn't know much about sports. She didn't play sports. What would you tell that mom to say, hey, here are maybe the top five things as you're on this recruiting journey with your student athlete, what are the things that that mother and that child, whatever sport it may be, because the recruiting process is somewhat similar no matter what the sport is, what should they be looking at in that school, that coach, that program? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you have to go into recruiting with a plan. Um, mm -hmm. You have some decisions that you have to make with your son or daughter in the recruiting process as to what type of school are you looking for? Do you want a suburban campus? Do you want to be in a college town? Do you want to be, you know, for a DC kid, do you want to be in a, a city, city type campus like a pit or a temple? So you got to figure out what college setting best fits you. Uh, the next thing is, is, is there an area in the country you want to be? Like I know for my daughter, she wanted no parts of playing north of the Mason-Dixie line because she's just too cold to play soccer. And she was coming from New Mexico and we've lived in Florida. And so she said, I want to go down south or southwest or California to play. Uh, and so you got to ask yourself what area, region of the country you want to be in. And then two, uh, the next thing would be is kind of, and these are things you have to have answers for before you even start the process. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is, is what type of coach am I looking for? Um, veteran guy, hands-on guy, 
a very disciplined program, a style of offense, a style of defense, uh, whatever it is you're looking for. And then, you know, from there, you start looking and formulating what schools are showing interest in me, all right? Because sometimes we go and want things that maybe aren't being reciprocated. And, and, and that's where either you have to find out if there is interest uh, or not interest. And so, you know, I, I start there. But then I think when you hit a college campus, and there's just a couple of things for me that are really important. You know, the first question I always ask parents or I tell parents, and I've set our program up to answer these questions is, don't tell me about the guys that you have that have gone to the NFL. I want to hear about the guys that didn't go and what they're doing. So give me a list of the players that aren't in the NFL and some of the things they're doing with their lives and careers. And, you know, you have doctors and lawyers or businessmen or, you know, give me some examples because we spend a lot of time in recruiting by talking about we have 27 first round draft picks and everybody knows who know who they are. But if you have 27 first round draft picks in 10 years, you've had over 250 other players that didn't go in the first round. Let's hear what some of those guys are doing. And hopefully they're doing some big things outside of football to show the power of what that degree from that university can do for you. The next thing I tell them is when you get on campus, talk to the players. Mm. The players aren't going to lie. The coaches will tell you a little white lie. They'll kind of fib and, oh, yeah, we're getting a new facility built in next year and this going to be happening next year. They sell you a lot of dreams. Or we do this with our players. I take my players to church every Sunday. And then, you know, you get on campus and all of a sudden you talk to – you know, little Billy, the running back, that they, they try to put around you the guys that they want around you, but, you know, randomly find other people on the team that aren't necessarily hosts and mosey up to them and ask them the tough questions. Like, hey, talk to me about your experience here. Talk to me about your experience with your position coach. How often do you get the, your relationship with the head coach? All those things are questions that you, you, you find out and the players are going to always tell you the truth. They're the biggest allies that uh, that that we have as a program, so I think that's an important thing to do. Um, and then, obviously, you know the resources of what they have uh, to ensure that your son or daughter will have opportunities to graduate. You know, I think that's critical. Do they have the study hall, the tutors, and most programs? I mean, when you start dealing with Division One programs, like you said, we all offer those things. Mm -hmm. But I always say this: it's not the brick and mortar piece of it it's the personal touch piece. Like, you know, I know, you know, how often is Coach Locks involved with you academically? I'm not an academic counselor, I'm a coach, but guess what? When we had those Thursday meetings, I would take notes on all my position group guys and I would be sending a text message saying, hey, congrats on getting a 96 on that Com 120 exam. You know, you got to, or I send a text out, hey, you got a big paper due Friday. Make sure you send me a picture and let me know you got it done. Like, those are all the little personal touches where the players are hearing it from outside of me and, and hearing it outside of the, the academic people is not just their issue, it's my issue because I'm actually the one that sat on the couch and told your mom and dad that I'm going to make sure I make you the best version of yourself academically, athletically, and socially. That's awesome. And then my second part of that question is, this is a question that I get all the time is what do you think and from a parent's perspective now about the different clinics you know they hold all these different camps and clinics and parents call me all the time man what what camp what clinic and i'm i'm not an advocate of the big week-long camps i just don't think they serve a whole lot of purpose to athletes that's me personally so what do you think i'm just like hey if you got what it takes and they want you you need one or two days max to show them that and if they, they have interest, they're going to see it in one or two days. It don't take five days to figure that out. Those things are money grabbers. But what's your perspective on that? Because parents ask this question all the time. What camps should I be sending my student athlete to? Well, I, I look at it from two different points of view, as a parent and then as a coach. Mm -hmm. so one, what I would say is the younger the prospect is in the recruiting process, I don't mind if a ninth grader or tenth grader goes to a camp where it's a three or four day camp, if there's good teaching going on, right. if he to take things from that camp to become a better football player during his season. So mm -hmm. 
I think there's a couple of ways to look at it. So those ninth, 10th graders that are just starting to, you know, get recruited, I, I do the research and say, hey, here's are some good camps that people have for teaching technique and fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Now, as you get to 11th and 12th grades, you've had film, you've got plenty of film out there. Um, I do think the one day camps are the way to go. You know, here at Maryland, because of where we're located, you know, we're within, we're a suburban setting that has DC, Baltimore, all within 25 minutes of our campus. I mean, we, we have 500 kids here for our camp because sometimes parents want looking for babysitters in the summer, but we have just so many kids that have access to come here. And my big thing is, is I want to teach the game of football. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not here just to get a check from you and, and babysit you. I want you to come here and feel like you left here a better football player because of the time you spent at our camp. Now, when you get to that 11th and 12th grade year, we have one day camps that are designed for us to be able to come put you through a workout and say yes or no. Right. You know, if they dragging their feet after you do the workout, trust me, you, you know, there may be some things you're missing that they are looking for that you don't have. And it doesn't mean that they eventually won't take you because you may keep developing and during the season they come watch you. So I, I agree that depending on what you're looking for out of camp and what stage in the recruiting process you're in, uh, I do think there's some benefits of the, the week long camps if you're, if they're, places you go and they are doing a great job of teaching the game and the fundamentals and the techniques. But then once you kind of get to that junior going into your senior year or sophomore going into your junior year, some of those one day camps are probably more beneficial because you can get to more of them, which gives you more exposure um, in terms of getting you around uh, more coaches that have opportunities. I'm a big believer in those one day camps. The more different schools that are at these camps, the better. Because, you know, sometimes you go to a one-day camp and you've got, you know, MAC schools and one AA schools and then even some other Division One schools that back in the day they used to be able to come to these camps. And now you get more bang for your buck. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Well, Thank I you. think it's a good <laughs> segment of our interview to allow Coach Loxley to enter the zone. And so entering the zone is giving you an opportunity to kind of leave some last parting words with some of our audience. So what would you like – someone to remember from this interview? What are some key points? Well, I think the first thing is, is obviously, you know, you're going to have failure in your life and and, and and it doesn't have to be sports. It can be any part of your life. I mean, I lost a son three years ago and uh, it could have just derailed everyone in my family and we all still hurt from it. But Failure isn't final and you take adversity and, and you find a way to use it to motivate you to be better. And so, you know, losing my son, I used the motivation of, you know, I never was one that valued time. I always thought time, I would always get a chance to see him be a father, uh, get married. And then, so you put things off and you take it for granted. Well, now if you walk in my office, I have these time capsules all over the place to remind me just how valuable time is a commodity um, and that you don't get it back. And it's way more valuable than any amount of money that you can make. And so make sure that you live every day as if there is no tomorrow because tomorrow's not promised. And our slogan here at Maryland is maximize it. Meaning when I go to bed at night and I lay my head down, I want to know that I did everything I possibly could do to the best of my ability so that if I don't wake up, I got no regrets. And so to me, uh, I start with that, that failure isn't final and unless you allow it to be. Um, the next step is that, you know, there's a place out there for every single football player. Um, may not be Division One, but if you have opportunities to get a degree, earn an education, uh, and use the Brown football to basically change the lineage of your life, be excited about those opportunities. And then I guess lastly for me, you know, the reason I got into this business is because of the role that males played in my life uh, as coaches. And, you know, one of my things that is really big for me even here at Maryland is um, you know, I want to build your resume for life after football. I mean, football is great. And I, I, I want every player, and I've had 98 guys that have been first or second round draft picks that I've recruited over $750 million in contracts of players that have been under my tutelage over the last 30 years. But the, the thing that's more important to me is that I help you without the football, with that degree, with creating a network for you to make the same type of money with or without the football. And 
we've created some uh, programming here at Maryland with a mentorship uh, that we have with Fortune 500 CEOs that serve as mentors for each and every one of our players here in the DC metro area. So every player has a CEO of a Fortune 500 company that has a daily interlog in a daily monologue with constantly, and we create what we call life plans so that when they get done after three, four years here in this program, they have a network because as you know, it's not what you know, but who you know. That's and all fair. of a sudden this Fortune 500 president has spent four years getting to know you as a person and their Rolodex becomes your Rolodex. So that if you don't make it to the NFL, all of a sudden you're picking up the phone and I've seen just, I've gotten just wonderful reviews from players that have just left our program that have been able to utilize the programming that we've put in place. And so, you know, if you're really interested in being a great football player, but being an even better person, come on out and visit Coach Locks at the University of Maryland. <laughs> yes. And before I hand it over to Shalonda, can you, um, for some of the parents or just any of our viewers that want to go to your organization's website, can you give the, the official name and the website just in case if they want to read up on that? Yeah, the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches, ncmfc.com. Awesome. Well, Coach Locksley, we just thank you for joining us today. We thank you for all the, the nuggets of wisdom and the, and the encouraging words. And I think the most riveting thing was just your personal story of just overcoming just you know, obstacles through life. I just think those things are just so important and uplifting to just individuals, whether it's a student athlete, um, um, uh, the, the parents, or just individuals just in general. I think those personal stories just really add value to what we, as moms in the zone, what we're trying to convey to, to our audience. And definitely want to thank you for um, the acronym for SMART, TOUGH, and RELIABLE. Those are definitely keywords, but I think the most important thing that for me that you said today is failure is not final. And I think that is so key, especially in this time right now where everything is just so uncertain, mm -hmm. um, that failure is not final and that it's important, like you said, to revamp and to rebrand yourself. So thank you. Well, thank you guys for having me. This was a lot of fun. Uh, it's great to hear. I, I had no idea that we had, you had this out there for parents and for moms particularly, you know, I go into so many homes that are single parent moms that are thrown into this process. And if they don't have the resources or people around them to help them with it can just become overwhelming. And I witness it to the point that it's really, it's sad to see from the other side of it when, when, when moms and, and parents are taken advantage of in this process because they don't know. And my hat goes off, goes, uh, comes off to you guys for what you're doing and, being a resource out there and, and keep up all the great work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Coach Loxley. And you know, <laughs> we're trying. We, we, and I'm going to say this, and I know we're drawing this out a little bit. This was why we created the platform Moms in the Zone, just what you just said. All three of us went through the recruiting process. We have sons that have went different ways within their, um, you know, sports journey. You know, Shalanda's son, Derek, and her other son, Dalen, are at FAMU. You know, Emil is at Alabama. My son is at USC. And within that, all of us have different journeys throughout the process. And so we just hope that Moms in the Zone can be a blessing to another mother who's trying to navigate this thing. And it's not easy, you know. And so we appreciate you being on a guest on Moms in the Zone and just blessing us with some insight and, and, and resources and just wisdom to navigate it. And so we appreciate you. And so for our guests out there, I mean, our viewers, I'm sorry, for our viewers out there, tune into this episode of Moms in a Zone. We look forward for you to tune into the next episode. So that concludes this episode. Thank you again for watching Moms in the Zone.